ان الحمد لله نحمده تعالى نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم all praises do unto Allah, the Almighty, the Most Merciful, the Most Beneficent. It is He whom Allah guides, you will never ever be able to mislead. It is He whom Allah allows to go astray, allows to be misguided, you will not find for guidance. And I bear witness that there are none worthy of being worshipped, worthy of being worshipped but the Almighty Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his prophet, his messenger. One of the best things that Allah Azza wa Jal has uh, talked to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with in the Quran are stories. Stories, qasas. And stories are beautiful in so many different ways that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, when he would talk to his companions, he would use a lot of stories to tell them and to kind of get the feeling and to get across ideas to them. And this is a beautiful thing because back in those days, the companions of Allah alayhim jami'an, what they had is they had an ability to um, really in a sense reflect on the stories and see what the stories themselves mean to them. And see how they can actually relate these stories to something that's happening in their lifetimes themselves. And this is how Allah Azza wa Jal relates to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tells him, Faqsus al Qasas, tell the stories. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. يتفكرون, for they may reflect. For they may reflect. Or they may relate. And reflections, my brothers and uh, respected sisters, reflections is always, always about trying to apply the story itself to our modern day. It's really what reflection is, because really what's the whole point of us having stories from 1400 years ago, if we can't have them into some sort of use today, what's the point? What's the point? Why, why, would, why would we hear stories from the Prophet that happened 1400 years ago, if we can't use them today, is there any use? Any of the brothers, speak to me. Is there use? And guys, I know this is my first lecture at Sakina, but the way we do this, inshallah, and this is inshallah one of long ones to come, there has to be a back and forth, okay? I'm not gonna just speak at you, you gotta speak back to me, okay? And don't yell, just, just speak to me lightly, inshallah, so I will go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll answer you. So if you have an answer to the question that I'm asking, just uh, speak it out. Is there a point of us telling stories today, in today and age, if we can't put that story itself in some sort of use? There's no reason. There is no reason why we tell stories. And the truth of the matter is the companions were so, so uh, um, they, they cared so much about telling the stories that have been told to them by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to the point where they relate them what? In a hadith, they're really crucial to them. One of these stories, my dearly beloved brothers and respected sisters, a story that has been related by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Fi sahihayhima. In uh, the, the sahihayn of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And this story speaks. And the story is told by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. The story speaks about the three children that were able to speak in their cradle. You guys know what a cradle is? Very small little... Mahad, really, in a sense, small thing that you put a baby in before he actually does anything. You guys know what a cradle is. So the Prophet wasallam told the story. He said in the story, Only three people have been able to speak in their cradle. You guys know any of them? Isa is the most famous one of them all. Does anybody know a second one? Musa did not speak in his cradle. Isa, just, I mean, there's, there, here's the thing. There are more than three, but the Prophet ﷺ here is relating to the fact that there were only three. But we've heard of stories of more than three. Isa is one of them. And then? The baby of? The baby of whom? No, no, no. The baby of... During the times of Fir'aun and Musa, 
right? There's, there's, a, there's a baby of the mashita, of the one who used to do the hair of the, the wife of Fir'aun, as you know her, right? And there is another story that also speaks of the baby during the times of Ashabul Khdud, during the times of the people of the trench. You guys know that the baby who's, uh, was, who told his mother, Isburi ya ummi fa al haqqan, and she jumped into the trench. Regardless, the Prophet wasallam said there are three people. And then he started speaking about one in this specific time. And he said, there used to be a man. This man, his name was Juraj. Juraj. Have you heard of this man? His name's Juraj before? Juraj. Nobody's heard of him? Nobody's heard of him. Who's heard of him? Who has heard of this man named Juraj? Allahu Akbar. So this is going to be a good story. No, none of you guys. No one is going to ruin it for me. Alhamdulillah. طيب. Very good, inshaAllah. قَالَ وَكَانَ جُرَيْج رَجُلًا عَابِدًا The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Juraj was a man that used to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Now let me give you some sort of introductory about who this Juraj man is. Juraj used to be a man of the sons of Israel a long, long time ago before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came about. And what this Juraj used to be, he used to be a salesman. He used to buy and sell. He was just literally a man who just buys and sells. And he, yeah, he's just living his life. And he realized as he's doing this buying and selling and buying merchandise and selling, nothing really specific. He was a tajir that he wasn't very good at it. That he would lose money all the time. So he gave up on his profession and he says, you know what? I want to become a rahib. You guys know what a rahib is? Rahib. You guys know what a rahib is? Anybody knows what the word, do you guys know what the monks are? You guys know what monks are, right? Monks are these people who have given up on life. They said, we don't want to live, we don't want to buy, we don't want to sell. Only thing we want to do is we want to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what Juraj was all about. He said, I'm not going to buy and sell. I want to just now become a rahib, a person who literally lives his life to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Let me ask you a very important and critical question. Are we allowed to do that in Islam? No? No? Who says, who says no? Put, put your hands up. No? We're not allowed? We're not allowed to just worship Allah Azza wa Jal? Are you saying to me, I am not allowed as a man right now, today, to go ahead and say, Yaqa, I don't want to work, I don't want to make money, I just want to be in one small spot where I worship Allah Azza wa Jal all the time. Are you telling me I'm not allowed to do this? I'm allowed? Am I allowed? The brothers and older brothers. We are not allowed to do such a thing in Islam. This whole idea of rohbaniya, this whole idea of being a monk, you guys don't know what monks are, you guys, in, in Hinduism, and uh, I don't even know if it's Hinduism, it's like, anyways, all the way on the other side of the world, basically these people who have given up on life, they shave off their heads, they don't even want to look good anymore, they just dress in one thing, and all they do is they have given up their lives for the sake of their Lord, or for the sake of the God that they actually worship. So, Juraj wanted to be one of those people. Now let me tell you a story about how this came about, okay, just so, so we can ha place the story of, of Juraj itself into some sort of context. During the times of uh, Bani Israel, they knew that this was not the way to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. But as the story goes, is that there was different narrations, but I'll tell you the one that is more credible here about it, is that there were times when kings used to rule over these sunny, uh, the sons of Israel, and they used to be very corrupt kings. They used to be very corrupt rulers, okay? And they used to change the laws of Allah Azza wa Jal. And they used to pay scholars of the book to what? To change the laws for them so they can, they can have the laws however they really want them to be. But there used to be some people who didn't like this. Some scholars who were on the haq, some people who were on the haq. They used to say, this is not the right way to be. If the law is by Allah Azza wa Jal, then it has to be applied upon the, the rich people and upon the poor people, upon, upon the kings and upon the common people. So these scholars that were paid off by the kings, they told the kings, some people are talking all this about you. 
and they're saying that you're unjust and they're saying that you're changing the laws of Allah Azza wa Jalla and so on. So this is the story that goes basically about it. So these kings, what did they say? They said, okay, we're going to catch and grab all these people and give them a couple of options. It's either they follow our rule <clears throat> or we kill them or we push them away from everybody else so they don't live with us. So these were the options that were given to them. Some of them have said, okay, fine, you know what? We won't do this whole idea of Amr bil Ma'roof. We won't tell the people about it. What we want to do is we want to take on what they called at that time, Sawami'a. You guys know what a Sawami'a is? Sawami'a is this big cylinder building, okay? It doesn't have doors, it doesn't have anything, it doesn't have steps, it doesn't have anything. It's just quite high up, okay? And what the Rahib does is he basically sits on top of the cylinder, and he worships Allah Azza wa Jal for the rest of his life upon there. And what he has is he has a couple of like, um, uh, like jugs and a couple of, uh, you know, awiya that come down with, you know, down. So people, as they're walking by, they give him food and they give him everything. So he basically, whenever he gets hungry, he goes up and he raises this thing with a rope. And he eats from it and he brings it. Now he doesn't just, he doesn't want anything with life anymore. He just wants to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. So those people have chosen that choice. They said, you know what? Don't kill us. Keep us in no sawami'. We're going to stay in no sawami'. And we're not going to make any amr bil ma'roof. You're not, you're not going to see any hardship from us. Just as long as you put us on the top, you'll be able to see us if we talk to anybody. And at the same time, we won't see anybody anyways. And that's what we'll do. Juraj wanted to be one of those people who sits in the sawma'. Juraj wanted to be one of those people who sits in the sawma'. Just like I said, the sawma is what? This big cylinder building, basically, where everybody can see you. Right? And you can see everybody else, but you can't really speak to anybody because it's kind of, kind of far from you. One time, and this is the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi goes back now. One time, Juraj was sitting on top of his sawma. And as he's sitting there, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, praying, his mother came to him. And she yelled out to him. Qalat ya Juraj. And he was praying. And this was a difficult thing for him. He didn't understand what to do. He was praying. He was in the middle of salah. She kept on calling him, Ya Juraj. And he kept on thinking, Qala ya, ya Rabbi Ummi wa salati. He asked, he was, like, he was thinking in the back of his head, he said, Oh Allah, I'm being asked, being called by my mom, and at the same time, I'm in prayer. Which one do I do? He kept on saying, Oh God, which one do I do? And she kept on calling upon him. She said to him, Ya Juraj, faqala, Ya Rabbi Ummi wa salati. He says, Oh Allah, my mother or my prayer, which one should I do? And he stuck to the salah. Now Juraj, was he praying a fard? Was he praying something that was obligatory upon him? Hmm? Is this, a, is this, is this obligatory upon him? Is, is it a must upon him to be a person who sits on top of the sawma'ah? No, it's not a must upon him. Tayyip, I have a very good question for you. This is for the young brothers here. If you're praying salah and your mom calls you, do you answer her? All my questions today will be trick questions, okay? So you guys think about them very well, inshallah. If you are praying salah, don't yell out, guys. Just, just speak it out. If you're pray, praying salah, and your mother calls you, do you answer her? No. No? Yes. Yes. How do you answer someone if you're if you're if you're in salah with Allah? This man here is a faqih, mashallah. He wants tafsil. Tayyib. Yes. Huh? Okay, so it it depends. This man here is saying it's a sunnah and it's fard. Tayyib. Let's say it is fard. Let's say it's fard. No? No. So right now, okay, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, this, this in more tafsil. Right now, for instance, I walk into my house. My mom has passed away, rahmatullah alayha, but let's just talk about the fact that she's alive. And I walked into my house, and the adhan of duhr was called at 1 o'clock, and I walked in at 1.30. And I walk into the house, and as soon as I say, Allahu Akbar, my mom, my mom calls me out. She says, Mamun, what do I do? You continue your salah, you ignore her? You ignore your mom? 
طيب. If it's sunnah. But I'm praying dhuhr, brother. How can it be sunnah if it's dhuhr? Allahu Akbar. This brother here has, has given you the tafsil answer. طيب. Let me give you guys the answer here. The tafsil of the answer itself here, and this is a side note, so just so we can keep it, inshallah, correct, so you know what the answer that this man here has given to you. There are various opinions amongst the scholars, but the most accurate opinion is the fact that if you are praying sunnah, you cut your salah immediately and answer her. Because answering your mother is a wajib upon you, while praying the sunnah is not. Praying the sunnah is not. There's priorities here, okay? Very good. If you're praying, Afard, you're praying something that you have to pray. It is a must upon you to pray. And it's at the beginning of the time, then you what? You answer your mother because you have time to respond. You have time to finish your salah afterwards. If you're coming to an end of it, some scholars say what you do is you let her know that you're praying in a nice way while you're in salah. Like what, for instance? Like you make takbira, for instance, really nice and loud. I mean, if she's calling you and she's upstairs and so on, and you, you know, and instead of saying, you say, Allahu Akbar, so you make sure she knows that you're doing something in salah of some sort. At any given time, you never ever ignore her. You never ever ignore her. And subhanAllah, this whole idea about Juraj has brought this discussion about between, between the scholars. Because there is a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. الذي قال فيه وكان لو كان جريجا عالما قال لعلم أن إجابته أمه خير له من صلاته and this is, this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying if Juraj was a scholar he would have known that answering his mother what? precedes his, his voluntary salah his voluntary salah guys answering Allah azza wa jal when you're just making uh, uh, sunnah or nawafil or so on your mother comes before that without any doubt for this is for all the young brothers and the old sister brothers here and the young sisters and the older sisters it is a must upon you to answer your mother if you're praying anafila okay if you're praying anafila and when it comes to the actual fard then we talked about the two options that has been given to them before and here guys I want to talk to you about something really important before I go on in the story itself the hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he says if Juraj was a scholar, he would have known that answering his mother is more important than finishing his nafila. My brothers, this deen of ours, this religion of ours is a very beautiful and easy religion. And everything in it comes with ease. But everything in it has to come with knowledge we don't make up things we do not make up things we have to follow and we have to learn about our religion and many times and I'm gonna speak to you very frankly to the older ones and to the young ones many times frankly when Islam becomes difficult upon anybody and he doesn't know the answer between two different simple questions it is because he doesn't have knowledge he doesn't have enough knowledge and many times there are people who go astray people who commit to bid'ah and people who commit to all of these innovations and so on the reason why they get into these mistakes is because they don't have any knowledge you guys have ever heard of the story of the man who killed 99 people there was a man back in the days who killed 99 people right 99 people and then he wanted to make tawbah he says yeah how do i repent how do I repent? So he went to a man who is a rahib, a man who is a monk, the same way as whom? As Juraj, Allahu Akbar. This guy is following, mashallah. The same man as Juraj. And Juraj was a simple man. He was just worshipping Allah. He just wanted to worship, but he didn't have any knowledge. So the man who's a monk, this, this man who's worshipping, he told him, no, there is no way you can make tawbah. You have killed 99 people. How can you do such a thing? So he killed him. He said, yeah, yeah, I've killed 99, I mean, what's another one, really, you know. So he killed them. And then after a little bit of time, he wanted to make tawbah as well. And he said, I want to make tawbah, how do I do this? So they told him to go to, this time, to a scholar, Allahu Akbar. There's a difference between people who are very good at worshipping, people who commit themselves to Allah Azza wa Jal, but without knowledge. These people are respectable people. They're important people and they're good people. And they have good intentions without a doubt. But they often commit mistakes because they don't have the knowledge. This deen is about learning. It's about learning the deen itself. 
Very good. So now we talked about Juraj being called by his mother once. She came the next day and she called upon him and Juraj was also in Salah. Again, because he's a Rasulullah, that's all he does, it's his job. His full-time job is he prays Nawafil. And the second day, he, she found him praying, she said, said the same thing, she said, Ya Juraj, and he kept on answering, He kept on saying, Oh Allah, I don't know what to do. My mother and my salah, and because he's a man who's worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, he's in this middle of salah and stuff, he commenced on praying salah, he kept on praying salah. And she came the third day. Now, my brothers, mothers miss their kids. Mothers, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. Your mother will miss you. And um, the further you stay away from her, the more she will miss you. And this is something that every one of us has to be careful of and has to be aware of. The fact that your mother has emotions and has feelings. The mother of Jurej, when she came to him three times, and she kept on calling him, and he wouldn't answer her. The three times, she got angry. And she made a dua upon him. قالت اللهم لا تمته حتى ينظر إلى وجوه الموميسات. She said, Oh Allah, don't let Juraj die until he looks upon the faces of al Mumisat. al Mumisat, they were women that used to cause fitna to the men, prostitutes at that time. They used to cause fitna. And this subhanAllah يعني, is a very big dua. But what did she ask Allah subhanahu to do here? She didn't say to him, Oh Allah, don't let him die until he commits zina. No. She said, Oh Allah, don't allow him to die until he falls into a fitna. A fitna of some sort. And she specifically chose this fitna. She said, this fitna, the fitna of women. And um, I don't know, most of you guys are, mashallah, um, Somalis, Africans and Arabs. Pakistanis, I don't know where, where I come from. If a mother gets mad at you, what does she do? <laughs> where, where, where I come from? She makes dua upon you. I don't know why, why what, if this is the case also in, in all the cultures, unfortunately. But the, yani, the mothers, especially the ones who are not knowledgeable and so on, masakin, they, you know, they say, you, you don't come here, you know, and, or, or she calls upon you, don't answer, she makes dua upon you. Right? And this here, the mothers have to be fully aware of this. If your children is acting out, if your children is misbehaving, you shouldn't make dua upon him. You should make dua for him. You should make dua for him. So this is a mistake that the mother of Juraj has committed towards her son. طيب. After she made this dua, Juraj kept on staying in this sawmah of his. And the story goes is that the people of sons of Israel, they were so happy with Juraj and how, yani how he used to worship all the time. They used to love him. They used to think he was a good man. Every time they see him, Juraj is always worshipping. Juraj is always worshipping. And this is a good thing, subhanAllah, that people thought well of him because the man was, he was a man that he loved Allah Azza wa Jal. And there used to be a woman who was a baghiya. You guys know what a baghiya means? It's, she's, a, um, she's no good. Okay? She was a prostitute. There used to be a woman who was a prostitute. And they say, Astaghfirullah, you're right. And they say that this woman was so beautiful that they used to use her as an example. This was so, like they would say, there is no one more beautiful than this woman. She was an example for beauty. Well, subhanAllah, this woman here, she thought she can test Juraj. So she came to this group of people, the people that used to think well of him, right? And she said to them, oh, you guys think Juraj is good, huh? You guys think Juraj is a righteous man, huh? Well, guess what I can do? I can cause him a fitna. I can get him to commit to zina. Guys, this is not a story that's because we're talking about a story that happened a long time ago that doesn't happen nowadays. 
you guys are all, Allah, alhamdulillah, you've all lived in this country. This is an, a country where zina is quite easy to get into. And the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you will be thrown into some sort of fitness throughout your lifetime. Now these people who used to love Juraj, who used to think so well of him, used to think well of him, they got this woman, and this woman told them, oh, if you guys think of him so well, let me what? Let me test you guys for you. Let me test him for you guys. And they agreed. Now I want to, I want to tell you something. Even though, subhanAllah, a lot of people always say, um, Jazakallah khair. A lot of people always think well of you. But know that there are some evil people out, out there. They are out to get anybody who's righteous for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. There are some evil people out there, regardless of what, whether they speak good to you or whether they don't speak good to you. There are always people who try to what to distract you from the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. You guys always do, uh, some of you guys are doing hifz, right? Some of you guys are doing hifz. Who's doing hifz? So some of those people who are doing hifz, sometimes you're going to your hifz class and somebody calls you, regardless of whether they're Muslim or not, and you tell them, "Yaqi, wallahi, I'm busy. I'm going to do something." He's like, "Yaqi, come on, Yaqi, we're going to this game." And then they ask you, what is it that you're doing? You say, well, I'm just going to the masjid to do hifz. They go like, yeah, come on, yeah, let that for another day. Well, they're evil Muslims, right? And it's not because they're evil people. But the truth of the matter is, everybody, everybody wants everyone else to be lower than them. Whether it's in righteousness, whether it's in money, whether it's in anything like that. You will find times when people will try to cause you to be in trouble. This is just natural. Not everybody. Not everybody, but you will find people who will try to get you into some sort of trouble. If you stick to the way of Allah Azza wa Jal, and you are righteously on the way, the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you are bound to be tested. You are going to get tested. And I'm going to tell you something right now, and this is something that I'm going to say to you, and I, I say it all the time, and this is something that you should know. If you think that you are on the way of Allah Azza wa Jal, on the right path, and you're not being tested, there is no fitan, you're not on the right path. If you think that you are on the right path and everything is beautiful, there is no fitna in your lifetime, you have a good job and you have a family that's beautiful, everything is just good. Every time you tamr bil ma'roof, people listen to you and every then you are not, and you are not certain you are not on the right path. Why is this? Because if you look at the examples of the prophets, all of them, you will find that they called to the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. But they always, always had fitan, they always had issues, they always faced hardships. They always, always faced hardships. Every single prophet, every single righteous man that you can think of has faced some sort of hardship. It's a must upon you if you are going to be the person who's righteous, if you are going to be the person who's going to call people to the way of Allah Azza wa Jal, it's a must upon you to be patient. And fitan, my dearly beloved brothers and respected sisters, is not always hardship, it's not always loss of money. It's not sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a fitna that to you may seem good. Like a source of income that is abundant, but from what? From haram, can give you that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, subhanAllah, yani, so many of the brothers always recall, they say, uh, you've probably heard of this idea, but some of the brothers, they always say to you, Allah, yaakhi, I was looking for a job so hard, and I kept on calling Allah and calling Allah, and then all of a sudden, I kept on getting interviews from banks, getting interviews from places where they sell pork, getting interviews, and everybody wants to hire me. Fitna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you. Allah Azza wa Jal will test you and He will test you and He will test you. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to test you? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to test you? Yes, yeah. Now, to show you the right path? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to test you? Yes. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you so you know. So you know what the right thing is and what the wrong thing is. So you would know it. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows whether you're going to fail your test or not. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, just like I said to you, ease, gives you a lot of money. So you should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this fitna. And sometimes He gives you very little. So you should be what? Closer to Him and asking Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the major fitan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for mankind or for man specifically is the fitna of the fitna of women. Allahu Akbar. This man is studying, mashallah. The fitna of women. This here, my brothers, is not, we don't look down on our sisters whatsoever. But the truth of the matter is, and this is something that the sisters know and the brothers know, sisters can be the most difficult things that a man can ever deal with in his lifetime. They're hard. If they want to, if they want you to do something, you guys aren't married. <laughs> the married brothers here. If your wife wants you to do something, most times she'll find a way to get you to do it. Uh, very famous hadith قال, in dunya hulwa. The Prophet said this dunya is green and is beautiful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is leaving you in it so you, you can see what it is that you are going to do. قال الله تعالى, قال الرسول, قال الدنيا النساء. Be aware of this dunya and be aware of the women. And then he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, so the first fitna that Allah azza wa has brought upon the sons of Israel was the fitna of an nisa. This woman here, this woman here specifically, she wanted to cause a fitna to Juraj. Why is this? Did she have a problem with him personally? Did he, did he kill her mom? Did he step on her new Nikes? What, what, why? Why? Why would she want to test him? Why does this woman want to test Juraj? What does she have to do with him? She's, she's in a completely different class level. She's, she's a prostitute somewhere and this man is a worshipping Abid man who's a, a good man who sticks to the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it that she wants to get him into trouble? Why? Why? You know why? Why? Because she... So she wanted, she didn't want people to think well of him anymore. Jealousy. Many different reasons, reasons my brothers and respected sisters, you'll find that people, good people, whether they're good or they're bad, if they see somebody who's better than them, if they don't know the ways of Allah Azza wa Jal, what do they do? They try to bring this person down. Right? A person who's hafiz, a Quran for instance, uh, all of a sudden, some of the people who are around him, they don't want him to do this anymore. A person who's worshipping, other people who's around him, they don't want him to actually be a worshipper. This woman is a baghiyah, she's a prostitute, she's horrible. Just evil woman, Safiya, she has no, no reason. She has nothing to do with this man. And she saw, she saw these people talking about Juraj. She said, you know what? I'll make some fitna for him. You just wait. So she came around. Now, she put on the best clothing she has. And she put on the best perfume that she can have. And she used every single trick in the world, in the way that she walks, in the way that she talks, in the way that she does everything. So she can come in front of Juraj. While he's what? Sitting in his what? Sitting in the soma, sitting in his big soma, who called the soma, right? And as she's walking around him, she wants to cause him fitna. She knows that she's so beautiful. Once he sees her, he's going to immediately fall in love with her. And that she's, he's going to want something from her. What does Juraj do? Yes. Juraj doesn't even look at her. Juraj doesn't even look at her. Now I'm going to ask some of these teenagers in the back there, is, it, is this easy? It's easy? <laughs> Anas is like, yeah. You wait until you're about 14, Anas. Is this easy for you to have a woman walking in front of you, dressed in every single thing that she can, and she walks in front of you? Is it easy for you to turn away from her? Is it easy? No. No. It's not easy. Is it doable? Yes. Allahu Akbar. It's doable. You can do it, but it's not easy. It is not easy. Even some of these grown-ups here, so don't, don't look at them and think everybody here with a beard is everybody's a righteous man. Right? Some of these people, you ask them, it's not easy. 
It is not easy for a man to look and to lower his gaze when a woman is trying to literally cause him to fall into some sort of fitna. But Juraj stuck it out. And he said, I will not look at her. And he did not look at her. And that's because Juraj knew the moment he looks at her, something is going to what? Happen. Something is going to fall in his heart. He's going to either want her or his either his heart is going to, something is going to happen. He's going to fall into the fitna that he's worried about in the first place. So she came about from one side and one side and every time she would come about to him, Juraj would look away from her. And this is the command of Allah Azza wa Jal when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Muhammad, say, O oh Muhammad, to the believers that they lower from their, their gaze so that they may, so they may stay away from what? So they may keep their private parts and that is more pure for them. When you lower your gaze and you don't look at things, that you should look at. And I'm now not talking just about women. I'm talking about everything else that is very beautiful in this dunya. At times, you may want to just lower your gaze. If you, know, if you know you don't have the money for a brand new BMW, don't look at everybody else's BMW. Wallahi, I'm telling you something. I'm, telling you something. I'm a grown man right now. I'm telling you something right now. If you know you don't have the money to buy a brand new BMW, there's nothing wrong with having a brand new BMW, by the way. I'm not saying it's haram. I'm just saying to you, if you're driving on the highway and all you keep on looking at is the brand new BMWs you, and you are driving in your old beat up 1997 Honda Accord, that's my car by the way, so don't none of you guys laugh at me. You're going to get home? What? Just feeling miserable about your car. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has to see. You go home and you're like, man, everybody, everybody in the world has a BMW except for me. And you get home miserable. And as soon as you walk in the house, your wife sees you and you're like, oh, my, the, you're the reason why I can't make any money because you keep on asking. You're the reason why I can't have my BMW. And you go see your kids and your kids are asking, daddy, can I have some candy? Can I? You guys are the reason why I'm broke. And you just go miserable about every single thing. Don't look at what people have above you. This is the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the people who are lower than you. People who have less than you. You will feel blessed. You will feel that Allah Azza wa Jal has bestowed upon you a blessing that you couldn't imagine yourself. You say, Alhamdulillah, I'm riding my Beautiful 97 green Honda Accord and some of these brothers are on the bus, man. You feel good. If you're on the bus, you're on the bus. You say, Alhamdulillah, and I'm on the TTC. And some of these people are walking, man, in the snow. Alhamdulillah. This is something that you feel about it. The only time when you look at people who are better than you, when do you do that? Huh? When do you look at people who are better than you? Brothers. Talk to me. In ibadah, in, in worships. Not in sins, in worships. So if you see somebody who's righteous, mashallah, he's always praying his salah on time in the masjid, you say, Ya subhanallah, I would like to be like this man. And you look at him and you ask him, how do you do that? How are you able to do this? How are you able to make it five times the salah? And you ask him. But the person who has the BMW, you don't go and be like, yeah, how much money do you make, man? It's not nice. Don't, don't do it. So regardless, now we're talking about, we go back to the whole story of Juraj here. And the reason why I'm telling you these stories, side stories, because from the story, my brothers, I want you to be able to understand why Allah Azza wa says to him, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ In the stories themselves, every single story, there are certain things that you can take out. Every single story, there's some things that you can take out and you can ponder and you can think and you can reflect on them. This woman came to Juraj and she walked in front of Juraj and she tried to cause Juraj fitna. Juraj didn't look at her. He knew that this is not something he even wants. He doesn't care for women. He doesn't care. For, why would he even look at a prostitute when he doesn't care? He can have something for halal and he's chosen not to do that. So he says, I won't even look at the haram. And this woman got upset. How dare he? How dare he? I mean, I dressed in the best dress that I have. I put on the best perfume. I did every single thing I could. 
And Juraj doesn't even look at me. What a jerk. Like she was not happy with him. But Juraj is a righteous man. So as she's walking around and she's thinking of a way out, she found a ra'i. She found a shepherd. You guys know what a shepherd is, right? A person who's a ra'i, a shepherd is any, basically anybody who takes care of some sort of uh, animals. And um, she saw this man and she was, about, she was able to persuade him to commit zina with her. She couldn't get your age. So she went to somebody else who's less in, in him in righteousness. And she found this man and she was able to cause this fitna upon him. So she got pregnant. And she waited until she had the child. And she took the child to the people. Remember the people long time ago who used to think so well of Juraj? She went to them and she said to them, Ha, huh, guess whose baby this is? She said to them, this is... The baby of Juraj. You thought he was so righteous? You thought he was such a good man? Guess what? I got him in trouble. This is his baby. She's lying. And subhanAllah, yani, she's a woman who's a prostitute. Lying to her is not a big deal. I mean, she commits to bigger things than that. So lying to her is not a big deal. What's the big deal? She wants to just literally get this man in trouble. She literally wants to get this man. So what happened at this moment? Everybody who used to love Juraj, who used to be so happy about Juraj, they got so angry with him. They got so upset with him, they said, Wallahi, we used to think so well of you, Juraj, we are going to go ahead and beat you. So they went up to Soma. We I told you about his Soma that was built. Uh, it looks like a cylinder kind of thing. And they start breaking it with axes and rocks and every single thing that they can use to. And they brought him down from his Soma and they started beating him. And they started beating him. And they started beating him. And Juraj doesn't know what's happening. The Juraj doesn't even, doesn't even have any connection with the people. He says he's just calling them. What's going on with you? What are you guys, crazy? I don't have anything. I didn't do anything wrong. And then they brought him. And they said to him, Ya Juraj, you committed zina with this woman. And she had this baby. This is your baby. Now imagine the kind of fitna that Juraj is in. And yani imagine, you don't even know what's happening here. Fitna from Allah Azza wa Jal. So Juraj says, bring the baby close. Let me see this baby here. And as they brought the baby, Juraj said, can I pray two rak'ahs? Wallahi hadha mawqif. And this is a spot. This is a... Um, um, you couldn't imagine this. When you are in such difficulty and you are in such hardship and the only thing you're thinking about at that moment is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a spot that everybody can go into. Well, I had this subhanAllah from the spots and from the, uh, the attributes of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qalu idha hazabahu amr farra ila salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if he, an issue a hardship came upon him, he would run to Salah. Juraj, when he found this hardship, these guys said to him, guess what? The whole neighborhood, they're beating on him. And there's a woman who said, guess what? This is your baby. And he looked and the baby's there. Every single piece of evidence is against him. Now if I were him, I would have run. But Juraj said, no. Let me pray to Rakas. Let me pray to Rakas. Don't ever, ever, my brothers and respected sisters, think that, that when you are faced with some sort of hardship, that you have anyone else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it is an issue of money, if it's an issue of hardship, if it's a fitna of death, don't turn. Don't turn to anyone else but Allah azza wa jal. Let that be the first person you go to. Wallahi al-Azim. We always forget this. Sometimes we make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what? The last resource, you know. I need, I need a couple of hundred dollars, so what do you do? I'm, khalas, I'm stuck. My rent is due tomorrow and I don't have no money. You go and you ask your friend and your friend says to you, Allah, sorry man, I, I don't get paid until next week. 
you go and you ask your mom and your mom says, do you know I told you not to move out? And you go and you ask and so on and so on and so on. You ask every single person. You even went to the imam of the masjid. And he says to you, sorry man, the zakat fund is out. Then that's the point when you say, man, I have no one else but Allah. You test, you try everybody. And then you say, okay, let me go back to Allah at this moment. Then you find the person what? This is what happens all the time, subhanAllah. Yani, the things that, that used to always make me laugh. Um, uh, during, when I used to live in Sudan, and I used to live in Saudi Arabia, it's the same thing that used to happen, subhanAllah. During, during exam times, the masajid are filled with people. During the exam times, every single student is sitting in a corner saying, and just like you can feel khushur in the masjid and people's tears, people crying. And literally the next day after exams, the masjid is empty. People go to Allah Azza wa Jal only when every single thing else has failed them. Well, the truth of the matter is you should go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. And you should turn to your Lord as the first means. Juraj, as soon as he found out that this fitna is about him, he turned to Allah Azza wa Jal and he says, let me pray two rak'ahs. And this was the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he'd seen some sort of hardship, he would turn to his Lord. And this was the whole idea behind um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was in the battles, he would be the one who's making Qiyam Layl. The only one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <laughs> Raising his hands up and crying and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't turn to anyone else. Allah is first. And then everybody else comes second. And once you have this in your heart, once you have this in the back of your mind, khalas, no, there's no way around it, then things will fall into place into your life, in, for, for your life. You will feel at ease. You will pass your exams. You don't even know how it happened. You will, money will just come to you. You don't even know how it happened. Your wife will start to listen to you. You don't know how it happened. Your husband will be all of a sudden uh, the best husband you have asked for. You don't know how it happened. You ask Allah Azza wa Jal and things will fall into place. I promise you, Wallahi al-Azim, this is a promise. You can come and, and take it from me on the day of judgment if it does not happen to you. I promise you, you turn to Allah Azza wa Jal in sincerity. I promise you, Wallahi al-Azim, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sincerity you will be happy with your life. Regardless of how you see it, regardless of how other people see it, you will feel content. You will feel happy. You will feel that hardships are no hardships. After Juraj made these two rak'at, and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> now, let me talk to you about something here before we go to what Juraj did before the salah. Now these people started beating on Juraj. And the woman is a, what? She's a prostitute. I mean really, what kind of people are those in of his? Hey, just logically, this is Juraj, the man that they used to love, right? The man that they used to love, they used to love Juraj, they used to speak so well of him, and then a prostitute comes and she says to him, guess what, I, I got this guy in trouble. So they, right away they go ahead and they start what? Beating him, crazy. These guys are a bunch, I don't even know if the word crazy can actually be used in a prayer, but basically these guys are a bunch of crazies. They're just nuts. They didn't even think about it. And we, as people, to this day, my brothers and respected sisters, we fall into the same kind of things. We hear something about a person, whether he's a good man or a not good man, we always tend to believe the bad about people. We always tend to believe the bad about people. And this is horrible. And it's something that we always have to think about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يقول يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا O oh, you who believe, if some sort of fasiq comes to you with some sort of idea, some sort of naba, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Make sure you understand what's happening. Or that you may inflict some sort of harm upon people and you don't know. And another, uh, another, in another qira'ah, uh, hold back. Don't just go nuts. Tathabbatu, right? Who's Sheikh Khidr? Tabayanu, another qira'ah, 
The first one is make sure you know what's happening. And the second one is فَتَثَبَّتُوا Basically what? Hold back. Don't behave before you understand. SubhanAllah, I'll give you a very beautiful example of what the difference between those two words. This is something that you really have to know as Muslims. <coughs> because unfortunately, often things like this happen to us. During the times of the Prophet wasallam, you guys know the Prophet wasallam. one time he was in, uh, um, in i'tikaf, in his, in his masjid, and one of his wives came to him. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't like for his wife to walk at night time by herself, so he started walking her. And as he's walking her, a couple of companions, companions saw the Prophet ﷺ walking. A woman, they don't know whether it's his wife or not, just the, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ used to wear full niqab. They didn't know who it was. So what did they do? What did they do? Does anybody know the story? Huh? They hurried up. They're like, yo, we don't want to get caught up in this nonsense. We don't even want to be around this if anything happens. They didn't think ill of the Prophet ﷺ, but they didn't even want to think anything at all. They said, yo, we're out of here. And they started bouncing. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to them? Allah. What did he say to them? Take, take it easy. This is my wife, so on, so on. And they said to, they said to him, oh, Prophet Allah, we didn't think any evil of you. They said to them, shaitan will always what? Put these bad thoughts in your head. Now, let me go to the same example of the Prophet ﷺ. If the next day, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say this to them, and the next day, these men came about and said, Yaqub, we saw the Prophet ﷺ in, with a woman. Did they lie? Did they lie? The next day, they saw him, he's the Prophet, and he had a woman with him, right? He was the Prophet, he had a woman. فَالتَّبَيُّنْ He's basically what? Understanding, they should know before they speak about it. We saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They should have known it's his wife, or if they don't know who it is, they should what? Keep quiet. The thabbut is basically what that you make sure you know what you're talking about, understanding the events, because everybody can see an event, anybody can see anything that's happening and assume that it's evil and assume that it's actually what. But the whole idea is the fact that you should think well. SubhanAllah, uh, yani, I'll give you another example of this. Imagine a, a guy, you know, you're coming out of your house and you're going for salah and a person who lives right across the street from the masjid here and you know he's a Muslim man. And as you're pulling in and you know the iqam is going to be happening, you see this man coming in, getting out of his car, and you know iqam is about to be made and he goes, all of a sudden goes in his house, he doesn't come into the masjid. And you're like, oh man, I used to think well of this guy. All of a sudden he's going to go home before iqama, right? And you start to think evil thoughts of him. You say, I used to think so well of this man. And then all of a sudden, the next day, you realize this man was traveling. And that he prayed his salah while he was traveling ahead. Jam'a taqdeem. Right? You thought evil of the man, and the man had no, there's no issues, no problems with him. The idea here is that what I'm talking to you about here is when you make tabayyun, tathabbut, is that you think well of the Muslims all the time and that you don't speak of them unless you know what's right. And if someone comes to you with some sort of news about them, first of all, if it doesn't, if it doesn't mean anything to you, this news, just, just stay away from it. It's none of your business. If it means something to you, make sure you understand it. Make sure you understand the actual, the, the, um, the, the complexions behind the actual story itself or the reasons for it. طيب. <coughs> so now we said, Juraj has said, I'm going to pray two rak'ahs. I'm going to pray two rak'ahs. When he finished praying two rak'ahs, my brothers and sisters, as soon as he finished praying his two rak'ahs, he came to the boy. And we said that the boy is a small little boy. And he put his finger right in his belly. فَقَالَ لَهُ مَنْ أَبُوكَ Stay him, who's your father? This is a ghulam, this is a boy who's what? In the cradle, it's a young boy. قَالَ لَهُ مَنْ أَبُوكَ Who's your father? So he told him his father is the actual Rai. The little boy spoke back. He says to him, the father is the Rai. And this is what? When you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you all the time and you become a person who's only concerned of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa jal is the one whom you turn to when you're in trouble, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find amazing ways out for you. 
you will become a person who is so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will take care of you like a wali of his. That you may actually become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would take good care of you. The moment the people saw this miracle, miracle, I mean really a baby speaking, they started saying, oh Allahu Akbar, Juraj is a righteous man. They started rubbing their hands on him. Now they're saying, what, this is a man who makes babies speak. This is a, what? This is a crazy man. So they started, what, wiping their hands on him. And they started saying, oh Allahu Akbar, this is our guy. And they started doing all this crazy nonsense. They said, Juala. And they said to him, you know what? We now love you so much, we're going to build your soma, the soma that we broke down and that we beat down for you. We are going to build it for you with gold and silver. Juraj said no. Bring it back exactly how it used to be. I want it to be made out of mud and bricks. The story, my brothers and respected sisters, it ends here. And um, the whole idea behind speaking these stories is that for us to know that we're not always facing the most amount of difficulty. There are people who have gone through harder things than us. And there are two ways for you to take. The permissible way of Allah Azza wa Jal and the way against Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And the way against Allah Azza wa Jal, it may, it may lead you to get away with certain things. But the way of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will always Always, always grant you a way out, inshallah. And then I will stop here, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfirullah wa natubu ilayhi.